Hi everyone, Adam from RethinkX here. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to talk about how technology and disruption is a fundamental game changer for environmental problems. So let's dive right in. All contemporary environmental problems are framed by three underlying assumptions. Scarcity, degradation, and dependency. Scarcity is the assumption that we're running out of natural resources. Degradation is the assumption that all human activity is harmful. And dependency is the assumption that humanity will always be reliant upon ecosystem services. All environmental problems are framed with those three assumptions today. And technology and disruption is going to make all of those assumptions false in the decades ahead. So, in a fundamental sense, it's scarcity, degradation, and dependency themselves that are our real environmental problems. Up until now, environmentalism has been virtually synonymous with learning to accept and live within those three constraints. But that's made it a defeatist enterprise. Because as long as conditions of scarcity, degradation, and dependency persist, every victory for the environment will come at a terrible cost to humanity, and vice versa. So until we break free of these constraints, we're trapped. We are trapped in a no-win scenario. The question is, how do we escape? I don't believe in the no-win scenario. Well, scarcity is ultimately caused by a shortage of labor. Goods and services are only expensive because of all the labor required at every step of every supply chain. And that includes preventing and managing and cleaning up waste along the way. It follows that if we had an unlimited supply of ultra-cheap labor, very few things would be scarce enough to warrant a price tag. Now, it's intelligence that has always been the limiting factor for replacing human labor with machines. Once we break through that barrier, the sky is the limit. Unlike people, robots don't take 20 years to reproduce and train. They don't need rest. They don't need to be paid. None of the old rules about labor apply. Is energy scarce and expensive? Build more robots to make energy. Are raw materials scarce and expensive? Build more robots to obtain raw materials. If anything is scarce and expensive, including robots themselves, then the answer is to build more robots, including robots to clean up and prevent environmental impacts along the way. Now, it's almost impossible to overstate how profound the disruption of labor will be. All of our institutions are designed around scarcity. The disruption of labor by AI and automation will completely transform human life. To the same degree that language and fire and the wheel and electricity and other fundamental technological shifts have. Economics itself breaks without scarcity. This is truly uncharted territory. And although it's going to be amazing in the longer term, we do need to be prepared well in advance to minimize the harms to individuals, communities, and society along the way. Okay, degradation. Well, today, preventing ecological degradation and restoring degraded ecosystems has proven prohibitively expensive. But that's going to change as the disruption of energy, transportation, food, and labor slashes the cost of everything. The disruptions will also give us the overall prosperity we need to solve our biggest environmental problems, the most obvious example being climate change. With today's technology, the task of reaching net zero emissions alone seems daunting. And to go beyond that and remove hundreds of gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere and oceans, that seems all but impossible. But by the 2040s, superabundant clean energy, clean transportation and other machinery, 
billions of acres of land freed from animal agriculture combined together with superabundant automated labor will make both mitigation and restoration of the climate possible. And it's not just climate change. Consider every scrap of litter, every shred of waste, every drop of toxic gunk or goop that you and I have ever seen could have been cleaned up if someone or something had the time and energy to do so. It's just like ants will happily clean up every last speck of food that you spill in the grass at a picnic. Now, ecological restoration takes more than just cleanup, of course. It involves carefully reintroducing and cultivating native species, removing invasives, controlling soil erosion, managing fire and water to promote appropriate patterns of disturbance and succession, and much more. But all of that becomes vastly easier amidst prosperity and abundance than amidst austerity and scarcity. And finally, dependence. Today, we care about the environment primarily because we need it. Ecosystem services provide us with our air, our water, our food, our fiber, and much more. But this treats the rest of the natural world merely as a tool for our benefit. It only grants instrumental value to nature. It's useful to us. That ignores the intrinsic value of nature, which has its own right to exist. Sure, you can convince people to protect forests and wetlands and coral reefs by arguing that our well-being depends on the well-being of those ecosystems, but that's clearly anthropocentric. And it's a dangerous game to play for two important reasons. The first reason is that people disagree about how much exploitation of nature is acceptable. As long as there's a trade-off between humanity and nature based on dependency, there will always be disagreement over where to strike that balance. And this has led to conflict and violence many times in many places throughout history. And the second reason is that arguments for sustainability based on dependence only weaken over time as technology grants us ever greater control over the physical world. The logical implication here is clear. The best way to avoid over-exploiting nature is to never need to exploit it at all. The only possible way to achieve that is with technology. Now you can almost hear the objections, right? I've certainly heard all of them before. Unlimited clean energy? Unlimited robotic labor? That's all just science fiction. Well, okay, but remember, environmental sustainability is about thinking decades ahead. So if the technology doesn't arrive until 2065 instead of 2045, does that make any real difference in the scheme of things? The point is that this isn't hundreds or thousands of years in the future. Disruption is coming. Now, challenging the assumptions of scarcity, degradation, and dependence around which all of today's environmental problems are framed is obviously unorthodox. Because under the prevailing orthodoxy, well, clean energy, clean transportation, clean food technologies, they won't really be able to replace coal power stations or gasoline vehicles or animal agriculture. Not until the end of the century, if ever. So hanging our hopes on them is seen as a distraction from the more pressing task of trying to convince everyone today to massively downgrade their lifestyle. And worse still, the prevailing orthodoxy holds that if we were permitted to believe that technological solutions actually are within reach, well, that optimism might encourage complacency about environmental issues. And that would make selling sustainability as a noble sacrifice even harder. I think that explains some of the otherwise surprising antagonism toward new technology within the environmental community. And I get discouraged when I hear derogatory terms like technofix and bogus claims that 
Well, mining for solar and batteries even holds a candle to mining for coal and oil and natural gas, but I think that's where it's coming from. Maybe worst of all, some of my fellow scientists believe that the stakes of climate change are so high that we can't afford to encourage anyone to be optimistic. The danger of complacency is just too great. Well, thankfully, all of that pessimism and cynicism, it's dead wrong. Solutions are within reach. Optimism has never been more justified, and it's because of technology and disruption. And we're going to dig into the details of exactly why over the next few videos. So that's it for today. There are links to the book and to Rethink X's other work in the description. And if you haven't already, please do be sure to help boost this message of optimism in those AI algorithms by subscribing and giving us a thumbs up. Thanks everyone for watching. And just remember, the future is brighter than you think. We'll see you all next time. Take care.